at this point in time, Wales effectively become a militarised zone. You know, you had a huge military presence in there, and there were all these little insurrections going on, little, little uh, actions going on, you know, toll houses being burnt down, soldiers going out to try and find them, uh, holding, in, holding in suspects, uh, interrogating them and doing all kinds of stuff like that, and then trying to get them uh, prosecuted in the court and failing to do so. Or, you know, the law had been com brought completely into disrepute be because of, of the fact that people were, were doing all this rioting and they were getting away with it. You know, you can't, you can't let that happen. You've got to stamp down somehow. They, they were really scared that these insurrections could tip into... Could spread, yeah. In, could spread and tip into a full, full of range things. It, it basically saying your nation's worth nothing. You know. Very interested to know in the comments if people outside Wales watching this are aware of all this. I mean, this is all pretty solid folklore in Wales, isn't it? The folklore in Wales, I was never taught in school. That's true. I was never taught in school. No, my no, family no, no, taught no, me I, this. I, yeah. I, I was taught it, taught my parents, grandparents, and people like that. But, yep. uh, and uh, and, and um, a lot of workers in, in, in Wales that still remember it, but it's not taught, it was never taught in school. No, you're quite right. You're quite right. I never was, yes. But there, yeah, there you are. That, that's the uh, hmm. mosaic in the underpass at Newport. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good. So the, ne the next one we had then was the, the 1839 to 1843 Rebecca riots. Now this is generally portrayed as men dressed up in women's clothing, marauding the countryside, destroying toll gates, um, et cetera, et cetera. But these riots had a much much bigger agenda than that. Uh, it was much more than that. Um, if you if you look at the next one, there, yeah, there were a whole series of issues which caused these riots. The 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 increase in the tolls was was the spark that set it off, and yeah, there was basically deepening social division in in, in that part of Wales. This is more towards the west of Wales, Carmarthen, than around that area where where, it, where this one happened big time. Uh, there was deepening social divide between the English speaking Anglican church going landowners um, and the Welsh speaking chapel going farm tenants and labourers. Um, the big thing on this one and which caused the uh, English establishment real, real grief was that despite all their efforts and despite all the turnpikes that were, that were what we would do is actually rip, you know, break, break down the, 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 the toll gate itself and, and this is coming back to the first thing I said, one of the things I said at the beginning, the use of fire. They set fire to the toll houses. Right, right, right. So it wasn't just we ripped down the, the toll gate. You ripped down the toll gate and then you fire set the fire building. to the building. Right. Okay. And despite huge effort by the, the authorities, they could never actually, and, and they brought a number of people to trial, but they could never, ever get them convicted. Um. And there's two reasons why they couldn't get them convicted. One was that this was a, a much more well-organized um, uprising <laughs> or rising yeah. uh, than, than the Merthyr or, the, or the, um, the Newport one. And they, they were into intimidating witnesses. Anyone come forward to witness against them, they got the house burnt down. Now, if you had your house burnt down in those times, that was it. You know, you haven't got insurance and you don't get it built again. Mm -hmm. You lose all your possessions. You lose everything you've got. You're on the street, yeah. So, so people were not, were not, you know, were not coming forward to, with evidence to, against anybody. So there was a, there was a great big, huge uh, program of intimidation. Um, and the second thing was, if they ever got into court... Uh, all the courts were being held in English, uh, and they were Welsh jurors. So they let the Welsh boys off. <laughs> and, and, and as a result of that, at this point in time, Wales effectively become a militarised zone. It become, it become, it become basically like um, Afghanistan or Iraq. You know, you had... A huge military presence in there, and there were all these little 
insurrections going on, little, little uh, actions going on, uh, toll houses being burnt down, soldiers going out to try and find them, uh, hauling, in, hauling in suspects, uh, interrogating them and doing all kinds of stuff like that, and then trying to get them uh, prosecuted in the court and failing to do so. Not one person, well, despite all of the damage and all of the chaos they created, not one person was ever um, caught for the Rebecca riots. Well, amazing. Uh, and, and as a result of that, the Rebecca riots and, and the, the previous one at Newport, because that was the largest armed insurrection to date in, 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 uh, in Britain, you know, that something had to be done. Um, five key issues were identified. The Welsh language, this was seen as the, the evil, the nurture of all the disorders in Wales and being an impenetrable barrier between the ruling class and the, and the, and the lower classes. Education, um, all of the ironmasters were screaming for better educated and more importantly, more compliant workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, Welsh, the Welsh guys in particular were seen as uh, very belligerent. Um, <laughs> they were not seen as you know, sort of cooperating with, with them and uh, they were not doing what they told, basically. <laughs> that doesn't sound like Welsh people, does it, Bob? No, no, no. They're, they're not much has changed, does it, really? <laughs> and, and then the law... A lot, of the law the, was the, a lot of the language is the problem behind that, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the law... You know, the law had been com brought completely into disrepute, you know, so be because of, of the fact that people were, were doing all this rioting and they were getting away with it. You know, you can't, you can't let that happen. You've got to stamp down somehow. And then religion. Um, the, the Anglican Church uh, has totally miffed at the fact that the, <laughs> the non-conformist churches have got this stranglehold on Wales. They didn't have any power in Wales. They didn't have any voice. And is it any wonder? They kept on sending bishop and clergymen to Wales. Couldn't speak Welsh. Well, couldn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> couldn't speak English. Couldn't speak Welsh. Yeah, yeah. I could only speak English. Come on, guys, you know, get with it. You know, um, yeah, can, no one's can turning you see up. what's going on, you know. So, so th they were desperate for an in in order to try and get, get a stranglehold on the power and the power base in Wales. And the, the other thing that was going on at the time as well, we got to recognise, Britain had an empire. And it was being embarrassed by all of these rebellions in, you know, <laughs> occurring on their home patch. You know, they're out there in India and things like this, and they're trying they're trying to control it, and they're having similar rebellions over there. It's a bit more embarrassing when it's actually happening on your own patch. Yeah. So there was yeah. a lot of embarrassment and a lot and a lot of um, things. Yes. There was also a lot of fear because, as well, what they could see coming, uh, don't forget, because we're not that far now from the French Revolution and the other yep, revolutions yep. that happened in Europe. They, they were really scared that these insurrections could tip into... Could spread, yeah. In, could spread and tip into a full, full of the range of things. So we get, then got on to um, what we're going to do about it, guys. What we're going to do about it. On the uh, 10th of March, 1846... William Williams, MP, a Welsh boy from Pump Saint, um, got, up, got up and made a request for a public inquiry into the state of education in Wales. And you think, oh, yeah, what a nice guy, you know, that's, that's, you know, he's, he's trying to look after the Welsh people. Yeah, but telling me, if you look at his speech, that there, there is this bit where he says, the moral power of the schoolmaster is more economical and, and, and an effectual instrument for governing the people than the bayonet. So basically what we saying in short, subjugation by education. And that was the tactic that they went out, right? We, we can't control you guys, you're belligerent, you're, you're, you're not listening to, you won't do what we say and all of this, you're creating all of this trouble, right? We're gonna educate you. He went on to say, you know, it, 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 these people never stop when they should stop, you know. If you got and just said that, you know, we, we, we want to get Welsh educated and sat down, it would be fine. But he, he actually, yeah, they, they continued. Uh, and when I say Welsh being the language of the poorer classes, important works in literature have never been produced in it. 
<laughs> and again, you know, immediate fighting talk to, to yeah, all yeah. the lost nation, you know, it, it basically saying your nation's worth nothing. You know, you're Sounds worth like he's playing to his audience, yeah. yeah. What happened then was they passed it then, um, Parliament took it on, and then they commissioned this inquiry, and they got this Sir James Phillips K. Shuttleworth, the guy in the middle, to, to actually sort of um, run it. He's an interesting guy because he started out in medicine. He was a doctor. Uh, but somewhere along the line, he got into education. Um, in 1835, he, beat, he was a poor law commissioner up in Norfolk. But in 1839, he was appointed the first secretary to the committee formed by the Privy Council to administer the government grants for public education in Britain. So he was given this great big huge bunch of money and basically putting them in charge of ed educating um, the public. And by the public, I think they were really, you know, you, you're talking about the poorer classes because the, the gentry and all of that already got their schools and, you know, they, 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 they didn't need educating. Um, yeah, so in 84, yeah, more like uh, indoctrinating the masses, really, isn't it? By the sound yeah. Of it? So in 1841, he set up the first teacher training college in Battersea. In the you know in, in the country, so yeah, we got a big debt to owe to him because he set up all these teacher training establishments and things like that. But along the way, if you start reading into him and start looking at some of the parliamentary reports on him, um, there was a lot of questions marks about him. Um, he had a lot of power, a lot of access to funds, and nobody knew where it was going, they had no oversight on it, and they had no control over him. He was independent, he wasn't being controlled by parliament. He just created his own little fiefdom. And he was getting large amounts of public grants, and he was spending it, and he was obviously doing things, but the hints are there that he might have had his, you know, he might have had his hand in the till. But he also published um, a report on the training of pauper children, which is why then he got the job of actually then uh, conducting the inquiry. So he appointed then the three uh, the three commissioners, Robert, Robert, Ralph Robert Wheeler Lingdon, the guy on the right. Um, at the time of the inquiry, he was 27. That, that's obviously a, a painting of him as an older man. I couldn't find one of him younger. Uh, but when you look at him, you think, mm, yeah, he looks a bit of a mean. <laughs> looks like he's done things in his life that might not have been <laughs> exactly Yeah, he's right. a big fat uh, emblem on his chest as well, isn't he? Which is oh, no, no, no. All, all, all of these guys got rewarded for, for what they did. He was 27 at the time, and he was put, basically, he was the, the put in charge. He was the, uh, the guy that went out there with the two other guys. Um, they were all um, barristers, they were all from the legal prof profession. Uh, they'd all been called to the bar. Um, but you, you, the, the other two, um, Jellinger, Cookson, Simmons, was 37. He was the eldest one. And you would have thought, well, why didn't they put him in charge? Because the, the other guy then was only Henry Vaughan Johnson, he was only 26. So these are fairly young guys. Mm. And the, the oldest guy amongst them wasn't put in charge. And the reason for that, it, when you read through it, it's quite clear because um, this guy Lingdon was, was, was basically sort of subservient to uh, Shuttleworth. He, he, he was the guy that was told what to right, do, right, right, right. Uh, what, what to report, how to write it. He knew what the report had to find, make, yes. And to make certain the other two did what they were told. He was basically a hatchet man. And it's quite, it's quite interesting when you're reading the reports. You've got the three commissioners. They're all writing up different parts of the country. And you can, you can actually see their personalities there. You can see that this Lingdon character, when you read his reports, he loves putting the boot in. He <laughs> loved it. He lo he, he's a real hatchet man, you know. So, and I can see why Shuttleworth chose him. The uh, Cooks and Simmons, um, he was a bit more even-handed. Um, and he was, he was fair in, in the way that he reported things, you know, to Lingdon was quite clear, shoot the Welsh are worthless. Lingdon was a bit more even handed and some of the comments you see in, in, in his sections, he actually brings out, he was quite surprised at some of the things that he saw. Uh, and the other guy, Henry Vaughan Johnson, 
Um, he was a bit of a, to me, he, was a, he sat on the fence. He didn't personally write any comments. What he relied on was uh, as when they went, went out to do their surveys, they wrote to all of the Anglican ministers in Wales and asked for their comments. And they come back, and as you can imagine, the Anglicans didn't like nonconformists. They come back with a whole pile of bile. And, and um, rather than writing himself, Henry Vaughan Johnson hid behind them and said, oh, he said this, sir. He said this, you know. Yeah, he wouldn't say anything himself. Um, so you've got three completely different personalities. And that's why I think it's worthwhile people reading these reports, because you, you can, once you read them, you can, you can actually sense the personalities. You, you can see what they were doing. As I said, Lyndon was in charge of them. He was a whipper in, and he had regular meetings with all the others in the Lion Hotel at Wilth Wells for progress updates. Um, and and in, in some of the correspondence I've seen, they were saying, "Well, we, we don't. You know, we're working too hard. We can't come for the meeting." No, you're coming for the meeting. I want to know what's going on and and what you're writing. But yes, it was quite clear to me that his job was to make certain that what what they wrote supported the narrative that, that the uh, Parliament wanted.